Um, okay, well, I think we're ready to get uh, started. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Grimes Parker today. She's an associate professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech and an adjunct associate professor in the Tallinn School of Public Health at Emory University. Um, she holds a PhD in human centered computing from Georgia Tech as well. And her work has received numerous um, awards uh, and best paper nomination and has been funded through numerous um, uh, grants from the NSF, NIH, Google. Um, and I'm really, really excited that we have the opportunity uh, to hear Dr. Parker uh, today uh, speak about her really timely work um, in designing for health equity and in community wellness informatics. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Elena, and thank you everyone for coming on this Friday afternoon. And thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, so in the United States and in the world more broadly, um, health and well-being are not equally experienced. Some groups experience higher rates of and barriers to poor health, such as racial and ethnic minority groups and low socioeconomic status households. So let's look at some of the ways in which this fact is manifested in the United States. So first, where we live in the United States is predictive of our life expectancy. We see over 30 year gaps in life expectancy when comparing different parts of the United States, for example. And these gaps can also be seen at a much more finely grained level as well. So this is a map of the Atlanta area and it shows that people living just miles apart have large differences in their life expectancies. So living in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood means that your life expectancy is 13 years less than someone living just a few miles away in an affluent neighborhood. We also see marked differences in well being when looking at different racial and ethnic groups. For example, let's take the topic of obesity. Obesity is a serious health condition that is associated with poor quality of life, lower mental health, and a host of physical health issues, including diabetes, stroke, and some forms of cancer. And here we see that over the years, obesity rates have risen in the US. Drilling down, however, we see that the burden of obesity is not evenly distributed. Hispanic and black adults are much more likely to be obese than white adults. Now, if we look at children, we see that rates of obesity have been increasing all over the world for the past few decades. And yet again, we see that obesity is not equally experienced across populations. For example, socioeconomic status matters for children's health. Children in low income households are more likely to be obese than children who are in higher income families. And of course, we've seen health inequities further magnified amidst the COVID-19 pandemic with communities of color and low income households experiencing disproportionately high rates of COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. The fact that these significant and persistent disparities in health exist mean that we as a society have failed to achieve a state of health equity, meaning a state in which everyone has a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. And my work has focused on exploring how technology can help us to achieve health equity, the creation of fair opportunities for health and wellness, and the elimination of gaps in health outcomes. So achieving health equity requires creating intervention. And in the case of the work we've been doing in my lab, health technologies that address the many influences on health. So this is a model of health disparities that my colleagues and I adapted from the World Health Organization's model of health disparities. And there's a lot happening here, but the main takeaway is that improving health and reducing disparities is a complex endeavor due to the varying and intersecting influences on health. So at the micro or individual level, behavioral and psychological factors shape our health and well-being directly. For example, physical activity is important for well-being. At the mesosocial level, social and community networks, living and working conditions, these can all act as facilitators or inhibitors of the behaviors that contribute to well-being. So for example, 
Families are important social environments for encouraging positive physical activity behaviors and the associated health benefits that come with these behaviors. At the macro level, social, political, economic, and cultural mechanisms create unequal exposure to factors that inhibit wellness, such as experiences of stigma, racism, and unequal distribution of resources. So together, these macro, meso, and micro level determinants of health illustrate the complex challenge of trying to improve the well-being of marginalized and underserved populations. And so given these determinants of health, my work has examined how information and communication technologies can promote well-being by empowering communities to collectively engage in micro, meso, and macro level change. And I have focused on communities for a variety of reasons. Um, and I call this, this area of work community wellness informatics. So why communities? Well, communities offer several unique opportunities for improving health and wellness. For example, community members shared identity offers opportunities for mutual understanding, support, and cooperation. In addition, interventions that rely on individual effort alone have been shown to be less effective for marginal for improving the well-being of marginalized and underserved groups. And this is because of these social determinants of health that I've described. So in my lab, we've examined how interactive computing systems can be designed to achieve health equity, which uh, is, of course, a critical and crucial social justice goal. We've explored how technology can support various kinds of communities in pursuing increased wellness by empowering them to address influences on health that operate at the micro, meso, and macro social levels. And an important part of this work has been to use insights from formative, often qualitative investigations to build and deploy interactive computing systems. And through naturalistic evaluations of these tools, our work has sought to establish design recommendations for how platforms such as mobile health applications, digital games, and family data visualization tools can better support health and community contacts. So I'll talk today about three threads of work we've done focused on community-focused approaches to health equity. So first, I'm going to provide an overview of the landscape, um, really talking about how prior work has used technology to promote health and wellness in marginalized and underserved groups. And then I'll use these findings to lay the groundwork for the rest of my talk, focused on projects that try to affect meso-social and macro-social change. So increasingly, researchers have explored how mobile technology can address issues of health equity. And why, why focus on mobile platforms specifically? Well, we see them uh, having increased prevalence across socioeconomic groups. Um, they are a platform that is relied upon particularly amongst uh, non-white and lower income Americans for internet access, groups that experience disproportionate um, burden of poor health. They travel with people into the varied settings in which health decision making happens, and they also facilitate uh, network support. So we conducted a systematic review to examine in what ways mHealth or mobile health tools have been designed to promote well-being and underserved and marginalized groups. What works, what doesn't, what gaps exist. Our review focused on mobile health technology designed for lay people or patients, that is not for clinicians or health providers, and low SES and racial and ethnic minority groups. Our goals were to characterize the research landscape and opportunities for future work. And through iterative database searching and article screening, we developed a final corpus of just over 80 papers, uh, which we conducted a qualitative and a meta-analysis of. I'm going to talk about just a couple of our findings here today. Through our analysis, we found that the vast majority of papers in our corpus reported on the design and evaluation of mHealth systems that were designed for individual use. Now, this is despite social context having powerful influences on health behaviors and attitudes. And then carrying on from this finding, few interventions were designed to address the physical and or social environments that impact health. Instead, most studies evaluated technology that provided 
informational support, such as the delivery of expert knowledge, or behavioral support, such as goal setting mechanisms, which are influences on well being that operate at the in individual or micro level. Our meta analysis assessed how well the randomized controlled trials in our corpus improved the health of study populations. And while we identified moderate success in the weight change interventions in our corpus, this was largely due to one study that did particularly well. However, for the other outcomes that were measured in studies such as body mass index or HbA1c, which is a measure of how well blood glucose is being controlled, the studies did not demonstrate a positive effect on outcomes. And thus, overall, we did not find evidence that the interventions in our meta-analysis successfully impacted the health outcomes of these marginalized and underserved groups. And so one reason for this is likely the consistent finding across studies that there was waning use and engagement with the applications that were evaluated. As other studies have found, users of these systems quickly became disinterested in them and stopped using them. The findings from this review have highlighted several unanswered questions and under-investigated design spaces within the health technology research community. For example, more research is needed to investigate how technology can really support mesosocial and macrosocial change. And today I'll discuss some of the projects we've done in my lab to address this gap in research as well as this issue around um, designing for engagement. So first, I'd like to share some of the work we've done focused on racial social change. So over several years, we've examined how interactive health technologies can be designed to go beyond an individual level of focus to engage and facilitate change within families with a specific with specific attention to micro and mesosocial levels of influence on health. And um, so today I want to talk about a couple of family focused projects. So we know that physical activity is incredibly an incredibly important behavior. It helps prevent and manage chronic disease and supports mental health. However, low SES families face serious barriers to physical activity. For example, at the neighborhood level in low SAS neighborhoods, there are there is less access to safe play spaces. At the household level, there's less likely to be positive parental modeling of physical activity, specifically instances where parents are able to engage in physical activity in the presence of their children, showing that it is valued and demonstrating how it can be done. This is again in large part due to barriers to physical activity that low SES households face, such as demanding and inflexible work schedules. And yet parental physical activity modeling is crucial for the development of positive physical activity attitudes and behaviors in children. And because of the important ways in which family environments shape child physical activity, family focused interventions are critical for supporting increased child physical activity. However, such interventions are less common than, in, than interventions that focus solely on adults or children. Now, physical activity tracking tools are increasing in prevalence and offer one opportunity for health promotion as they help people collect uh, data about their fitness levels. Reflection on such data can be beneficial for health by supporting increased self-awareness and self-management of progress towards wellness goals. And various efforts have been made to explore ways of subsidizing activity tracking costs, for example, through a Fitbit and Georgia Medicaid partnership that provides trackers to qualifying patients with diabetes. Now we know that fitness platforms are prevalent, but not how they can be made engaging and useful for families, especially those who face extra barriers. Additionally, as our mHealth review showed, figuring out how to motivate engagement with these kinds of platforms is a challenge that has yet to be solved. And so our work has examined how socio-technical innovations can address these issues, specifically how technology can transform personal health data in ways that are engaging and useful for low SAS families. So to begin exploring this research question, we designed, built, and deployed a collaborative digital game and fitness data dashboard to promote family fitness data reflection and encourage increased physical activity in low SAS families. 
The system we built is called Spaceship Launch, and to use it, parents and kids wear wristbands that track time spent in moderate and vigorous activity levels. The more time spent being active, the more fuel the child earns to launch their spaceship to distant planets. Throughout the week, the family has access to a data dashboard that visualizes their activity levels. A trivia mini game, which is shown in the middle here, allows families to earn more fuel points by reflecting on the relationship between physical activity and caloric burn. Then, once a week, families are able to access the spaceship launch game in an interactive display that we installed in a community center in a low SES area of Boston. The center provides a free, safe space for families to be active together once a week. And a couple of goals um, that we pursued with this design were one, really trying to integrate the technology within an existing community-based program that was actually trying to do something to address this, you know, one of the major barriers in low SES communities, which is trying to find a place that is safe and free to be active in. So this program was, was addressing that environmental barrier. In addition, I mentioned the barrier of parental modeling in low SES families. With this dashboard, we sought to support symbolic modeling, or you know, even if parents and kids couldn't be active together, they could see this um, visualization of their activity as one way of helping to communicate um, activity levels and, and hopefully spur discussion around them. We conducted a former study to design spaceship launch and an evaluation pilot study to assess engagement with the platform and families' perspectives on how it could be expanded on in the future. So one question that we explored in this work is what is the social value of personal health data? In this case, the personal health data convey the time that each family member spent engaging in moderate and vigorous physical activity. We found that beyond just serving a cognitive purpose, for example, enabling self-awareness, caregivers saw data as a valuable resource for nurturing social capital. Parents discussed the value of comparing and discussing their activity data with their children, such as the bonding that can be facilitated as activity data is reviewed and parents help their children develop physical activity self-confidence. And so the, these data grounded interactions were seen as opportunities to nurture relationships within the family. Participants also discussed how they felt Spaceship Launch could be expanded to support competition with other families in the neighborhood. They were excited about this prospect, not only so they could compete with one another and have fun, they also felt that the data comparisons that would arise in such a scenario could help to open up opportunities for dialogue between families and meeting up in real life. And this was exciting to see because in our work, one of the um, values that uh, families communicated was actually being able to establish stronger ties with those in their community. And while that was a goal of this program, um, families would often come to the center, but not interact with one another. And so they saw this tool as one way of possibly brokering those relationships and opening up opportunities for dialogue. So building on these findings, we began exploring how physical activity promotion technologies can create these opportunities for nurturing family relationships, especially in low SES contexts. And we identified storytelling as one promising venue to explore. Given the ways in which storytelling has long been a way to support family connectedness and the transmission of values. So to this end, we iteratively designed an app called StoryWell. StoryWell integrates literacy promotion and physical activity promotion and seeks to nurture family relationships through physical activity grounded storytelling. The way it works is that parents and their young children were physical uh, uh, physical activity tra tracking wristbands. They set physical activity goals, which we call family challenges. They can then monitor their progress toward their goals in an engaging vi visualization, um, the second screenshot from the left here. If they complete the family challenges, they unlock what we call social rewards. These are digital rewards that support social interactions within families. Specifically, families unlock an interactive storybook chapter that they can read together. These storybooks have embedded physical activity themes, as well as reflection questions that 
invite families to tell and record their own stories recounting their physical activity experiences. And through these features, StoryWell has the dual goals of supporting meaningful experiential learning from physical activity data or micro level change and supporting the building of family capital, that is the building of positive relationships uh, amongst families or mesosocial change. Oops. We, all right. <laughs> we conducted a, a three-month study to evaluate engagement with StoryWell with low SES uh, families in Boston neighborhoods. And so one of our key findings was that StoryWell succeeded in building caregivers' interest and motivation to use the system, in large part because it provided three kinds of satisfying moments for caregivers to have with their children. These moments helped nurture connectedness within the family, a social process that is key for supporting intrinsic motivation to use a fitness promotion technology. So first, it provided bonding moments as caregivers felt closer to their children through the completion of family fitness challenges, unlocking and utilizing the social rewards, and responding to the reflection questions with their children. In these bonding moments, connectedness was supported as caregivers were able to notice their child's positive emotions while spending time together. For example, one mom said that it feels like a treat when the social rewards, rewards provide an opportunity for her to spend time with her daughter. Another mom discussed how StoryWell encourages physical closeness because it naturally brings the family next to one another as they read the stories. And yet another mother described her daughter's joy at unlocking the rewards and being able to share in that joy with her. These bonding moments produced immediate emotional satisfaction. Another type of satisfying moment was discovery moments. These moments with the app were valued because they helped parents to observe their children's needs, behaviors, and attitudes in ways that help them see how to further care for their children. For example, caregivers appreciated being able to witness their children's physical activity and reading behaviors and with, in ways in which they could support each. For example, one grandmother observed that her grandson was taking exercise seriously, particularly she was concerned about his weight. Another, a mom, one of our moms described her family's interactions with the app as being beneficial because as her son was answering the reflection questions, she realized his extreme confidence makes it difficult for him to handle failures and challenges in physical activity. These discovery moments produced a satisfaction that was realized in a more long-term sense than bonding moments, as they helped provide caregivers with insights that helped them to start identifying ways to provide further care for their children. And lastly, caregivers valued the educating moments that StoryWell provided. These were experiences with the app that helped them build skills in their children and pass on life lessons. For example, one mom described appreciating how the storybooks helped her son build his language skills, while another mom valued that the app helped her sensitive child to see that he is not alone in going through life challenges. These kinds of educating moments provided satisfaction that was also more long-term in that they helped to build up children's character and literacy skills in ways that can benefit them into the future. Identifying that StoryWell supported these various moments was especially important because they align with self-determination theory, a theory that helps explain human motivation. Each of the three moment types supported a feeling of relatedness, that is, being connected to and caring for others. Self-determination theory tells us that when interventions help engender these feelings of relatedness, that helps to build intrinsic motivation to engage in the healthy behaviors and to engage with the intervention itself. Now, these kinds of bonding, discovery, and educating moments would likely be valued by many families. They were especially important, however, for our families who had experienced much adversity in their lives. The discovery and educating moments in particular were important for our caregivers, given the missed opportunities that they had personally experienced. For example, one caregiver discussed growing up in foster care and without family to help her through life. This experience led her to want to provide a different life full of support for her own children. Another caregiver discussed the challenges that she has experienced in her life due to her racial identity. 
And in summary, caregivers experience missed opportunities due to a variety of factors, such as racial discrimination, their immigration status, and other challenges um, like growing up in the foster system. And so StoryWell was valued because these moments helped them to achieve their goals of providing opportunities for their children that they did not experience themselves through small moments of discovery where they identified ways in which they could further care for their children and brief educating moments through which they saw how they could help their children engage in learning experiences that would help them achieve their goals. And these findings help highlight the importance of designing health technologies that align with the broader goals and aspirations that families have for their lives. While the data that Sorwell collected and visualized was helpful for spurring behavioral goal setting and change, this alone was not what made the app truly compelling for families. It was the bonding, discovery, and educating moments that the various features in the system created for families that really drove motivation to engage with StoryWell. And while the findings I've discussed thus far have reported on benefits that family-focused fitness tools can have for low SES families, we have also investigated the challenges that such tools present. For example, we conducted a study to more fundamentally understand how well commercial fitness tracking tools support physical activity in low SES families. We gave parents and children activity trackers to wear for two months and installed the companion mobile apps on their phones. And what we found through our study was um, that uh, one of the major issues that arose in the context of trying to consider how well these tools could actually work and support families um, was the issue of community safety. So this was certainly one neighborhood barrier that our participants discussed. Um, almost all of our caregiver participants expressed neighborhood crime and safety concerns. For example, concerns around shootings, drug abuse, um, and gang activity in their communities. And in fact, you know, during our data collection, um, there were shootings you know, in the very communities that we were uh, studying. So crime was clearly a prevalent concern. And one participant discussed how this safety concern served as a barrier to adhering to the Fitbit notifications that would encourage her to get up and move to achieve her step count goals. She said that she ignores those reminders because if she listens to them and, and goes outside and takes the walk around her block, it could be the last uh, walk that she and her family take. And yet we also saw resilience to these safety concerns with many par parents describing reasons why despite these concerns, they felt comfortable with their children being active outside. Participants discussed how they viewed their community, not only in terms of its physical attributes, but also the local social connections they have, whose presence uh, is instrumental in building their confidence in their children's safety. And so some participants developed these mental maps of safe territories in their communities, defined by the social connections they have in these locales as a way to identify places where their children can be safely active outside. And this finding helps to emphasize the importance of socio-technical interventions that not only seek to support family uh, physical activity through features like nudges to be active. Helping families to actually build up neighborhood social capital is also another important avenue of work to really create neighborhood environments in which families feel safe and able to be active. And so building on this theme, we created a second version of StoryWell that attempts to build neighborhood social cohesion by helping families to share their stories of pursuing physical activity locally in their neighborhoods with others in their communities. In a four-week pilot study, we identified the ways in which these shared stories impacted caregivers' beliefs about physical activity, such as the extent to which physical activity is valued by peers in their community, and their own ability to be active. And in our future work, our goal is to assess how well this application can help to build neighborhood cohesion, specifically feelings of connectedness, solidarity, and trust amongst neighbors. And in summary, our work around family physical activity promotion suggests several ways in which personal health data can be made engaging and useful for low SCS families. At the MESO level, our work suggests the importance of creating systems that use personal health data 
to support relationship building within and between families. Such relationships are critical for providing social support for healthy behaviors. Our work shows the value of narrative and storytelling for augmenting data-driven systems and supporting valuable moments between parents and children, including bonding, discovery, and educating moments. And lastly, it is important to design socio-technical interventions that help people build social infrastructure within, but also between families as an important way to help to create social environments that help mitigate crime concerns. So in addition to uh, the maze of social change that I've discussed thus far, my group has also explored how technology can support macro social change. For example, our work has studied how information and communication technologies can help engender community participation in social action that confronts social determinants of health. So um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of projects here today, um, one focused on um, uh, online social movements as a way to address um, stigma around sexual violence, as well as work that we've done focused on um, designing tools to support youth civic action. So the first project I'll discuss has focused on studying the Me Too movement. So in this project, we have been studying sexual violence and the stigma associated with these experiences. So sociologist Irving Goffman describes stigma as an attribute that a person has that is deeply discrediting and that reduces them from a whole and usual person to a tainted and discounted one. It is the stigma associated with experiences of sexual violence that keep many survivors from disclosing their experience. Many fear not being believed, being punished, being blamed, or that nothing will be done. Stigma influences health through various pathways, for example, through the stress that it puts on survivors. And yet disclosures can also be beneficial for survivors, for example, by opening up opportunities for support, healing, and recovery. Now, online platforms offer opportunities for social support. For example, online communities like Reddit forums enable support seeking in an anonymous way. And in October of 2017, the hashtag MeToo rapidly spread across Twitter and Facebook. And this viral hashtag movement built upon foundations that were really built up over 10 years uh, before by activist Tarana Burke. The 2017 movement was catalyzed as, as actress and activist Alyssa Milano posted a rallying message that invited others to signal that they had been sexually harassed or assaulted by tweeting Me Too. And through these tweets, a goal of the movement has been to give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. This movement has functioned as a direct challenge and attempt to dismantle stigma surrounding, surrounding experiences of sexual violence and disclosures of those experiences. Now, interestingly, in comparison to online forums like Reddit, in which anonymity functions as an important attribute for catalyzing stigmatized disclosures, Me Too blurs the boundaries between public and private by enabling people to share experiences publicly, but through often accounts that are often personally identifiable and to a, a varied network of followers. And so my collaborators and I have been investigating the mechanisms driving the Me Too movement. We analyzed the sample of tweets and replies to tweets from the first two weeks within the Me Too movement. <laughs> and using a, a variety of methods have, have sought to um, try to characterize this movement and, and try to really capture the mechanisms driving participation in it. So one question that we wanted to explore here is, were Twitter users more likely to just tweet me too as the initial call invited, or did they tweet more? And we call a non-descriptive disclosure simply tweeting hashtag me too, because using this hashtag is a way of disclosing to the public that one has experienced sexual assault. And then we call a descriptive disclosure a tweet that has the Me Too hashtag and additional text that helps to explain their experiences. And we found that nearly all users were more likely to make a descriptive disclosure than a non-descriptive disclosure, 
And this was true regardless of the follower network size and hence the public visibility. So we thought that, you know, perhaps um, individuals with a larger follower network might possibly be more likely to um, make a descriptive disclosure if they feel, you know, a sense of responsibility to use their platform, or they might be less likely because they are um, such public figures. We defined potential exposure to disclosures as the number of times there were disclosure tweets by people that a user is following. And we found that greater potential exposure to disclosures increased the probability of someone making a descriptive disclosure. So the more disclosure tweets shared by people that a user follows, the more likely that user would be to share a descriptive disclosure themselves. And in fact, we saw this effect happening most strongly when Twitter users went from not following anyone who tweeted a disclosure to having a single person they followed tweet a disclosure. And lastly, we found that descriptive disclosures beget descriptive disclosures. People's likelihood of making a descriptive disclosure uh, increased when people that they followed also made descriptive disclosures. It increased the most when, when people in their network made these kinds of disclosures. So to summarize, we explore this question of how can information and communication technologies increase participation in social action that confronts the social determinants of health. One powerful, powerful social determinant of health is stigma. And our findings highlight how exposure, <clears throat> exposure to sexual violence disclosures on Twitter was key to driving people's participation in this Me Too movement. These disclosures help to create an environment that work to counter the stigma associated with sexual violence disclosures. And in the last project I'll present, we have been exploring how social networking apps and social computing platforms more broadly can directly support youth participation in activism. So there's been much optimism much optimism around how social media can really work to increase youth participation in civic engagement. For example, because um, social networking tools are platforms that youth use frequently and because they give youth access to often large networks. And yet questions remain as to how well founded this optimism is and challenges that youth face in using these platforms to engage in activism that counters meso-social and macro-social barriers to well-being, as well as questions remain around what opportunities exist for creating technology that can actually better support youth. So we've been studying social computing use and potential for use in youth empowerment organization contexts. These organizations and programs exist around the world, and they help youth identify and address, address problems within their communities. While there is a growing literature characterizing trends in youth participation in online social movements, little work has explored how youth within this empowerment organizational context use technology to support their work. The organization that we have been working with specifically empowers low SES and youth of color to identify social issues in their communities and to address these challenges. Within the program, youth um, who were in their teens and early 20s seek to educate and mobilize their peers to address societal issues, such as racism and police youth relationships. So we've conducted various qualitative and participatory design studies to understand current use of social media amongst these activists and opportunities for the design of future systems. And our findings have highlighted some ways in which empowerment organizations help to facilitate youth use of social media for activism. Within the organization we studied, youth use social networking tools to promote their events and encourage their peers to come to these events. The video here is an example of a video shared, shared by youth in the organization we studied to give their communities a preview of an upcoming event. In sharing videos and other content on social media, youth in the organization attempt to mobilize their peers to address community health issues at the meso and macro levels. And yet youth described negative feedback that they received from their peers. For example, being called goody goodies or snitches for partnering with the police. And yet 
we saw that these youth also exhibited resilience in the face of negative feedback that they received to their online posts. And this is in large part a testament to the support that um, the organization provides youth to build up their identity and their confidence as youth activists. And indeed, youth described how encountering conflict from others in response to their activist efforts was a source of empowerment, making them want to work even harder to pursue their social justice goals. And yet, youth face challenges as well. First, youth are initially recorded into the organization such that the demographics strategically reflect the composition of the communities from which youth are drawn. And so the youth activists begin with many of the same perspectives on social issues as their peers. They come from similar social circumstances and face many of the same challenges. However, these youth evolve as part of their work in the organization and their perspectives on shared social issues evolve, while many of their peers remain the same. This creates a disconnect between youth inside and outside of the organization. For example, through the youth police dialogues that youth host, they begin to see the possibility of healing the friction between youth and police, and they increase in their sense of confidence and their ability to be leaders in addressing this issue. Yet their peers outside of the organization may remain unpersuaded of, for example, the importance of improving youth relationships or their ability to play a role in such change. So when youth activists post a flyer for an event they're hosting, their peers may not see the value in attending. And this in turn inhibits the activist's ability to successfully convert their online activism into offline participation in their event. In addition, we found that when the youth would post content online in an effort to mobilize their communities to action, these messages were typically posted in a broadcast fashion with limited strategic thinking about their online networks affordances and how to leverage those affordances to accomplish their goals. And for sure, this kind of network thinking is not typical probably for, for most of us. And yet technology offers us the opportunity to support more strategic thinking. And so motivated by this finding, we've conducted work to examine how network visualization might help support more strategic use of social media amongst youth activists. In particular, we've explored how visualizations of features of one's social media networks can help youth understand the ways in which these networks can be engaged more strategically for civic action. And so to begin answering these, quest these questions, we interviewed youth um, at an empowerment organization. And during each interview, we asked youth to examine interactive prototypes that visualize their hypothetical network of Twitter followers. We use these visualizations to see discussion around the kinds of information about network connections that youth felt would help them to uh, engage in more informed outreach efforts. The visualization prototypes showed information about these followers. And in particular, one piece of information we showed was followers most frequently used hashtags. And our findings highlighted the important role that hashtags play in helping youth activists make sense of their social networks and make sense of how these networks can be more effectively engaged in civic action. For example, they use the hashtags to assess to what extent their followers were aware of social issues. Youth made these inferences naturally and without our prompting in their interviews. We only asked them to discuss what they saw in the visualizations and then to use this information to choose um, people that might be important for their outreach work. We also saw that participants use the hashtags as a kind of screening device. For example, um, identifying who they would want to reach out to. For example, they discussed using the hashtags to identify their followers' interests and thus who might be interested in the causes of their organization as participant 13 describes here. In addition, they discussed using the hashtags to identify who might have heterogeneous networks that would support greater impact. In particular, as participant eight describes here, they discussed using information about a follower's hashtags in combination with information about that person's network to identify people who have the potential to act as connectors to individuals with different ideas. However, we also identified one challenge with network visualizations that communicate hashtag usage. Specifically, we found that as youth naturally inferred meaning from this information, they were doing so based on very incomplete presentation of information about their network. 
That is, seeing a follower's most used hashtags does not take the full picture of their hashtag use, of course. And this incomplete presentation caused issues in two ways. So first, issues arose around the presence of limited data that youth were presented with. When reviewing their followers' most commonly used hashtags, some participants drew meaning from the fact that their contacts did not have certain hashtags listed. For example, when a follower did not have hashtags about social justice issues listed in the top hashtags, participants assumed that follower was unaware of these issues. However, of course, just because a hashtag doesn't show up in the most commonly used list doesn't mean that the uh, follower doesn't use them or that they don't care about those issues. And in this case, the design decision, decision made in the visualization, which only showed the followers top hashtags as opposed to more complete information, might have limited participants' decision making about their followers. In addition, we saw issues arise as participants naturally drew meaning through considering in concert the collection of hashtags shown for each follower. For example, when viewing that Marion used both hashtag cancer awareness and hashtag best sister, participant 13 concludes that perhaps Marion has a sister who is experiencing cancer. Not knowing the context in which Marion used the hashtags, for example, did they appear in the same tweet or separately, resulted in potentially erroneous conclusions. And indeed, our findings show how hashtags can adopt different meanings based on how they are visually displayed on screen and how participants interpret these displays. So to summarize, our findings point to several ways in which technologies can uh, increase community participation and social action. First, tools are needed that help to bridge the gap between youth who are seasoned activists or those who are part of community organizations that provide support to activists, bridging the gap between these individuals and youth in the broader community. Second, our work suggests the value of technology that helps youth in gaining more insight into the social capital within their networks to support more strategic activism. And this kind of work will need to mitigate against misanalysis that can arise from the ways in which network information is visualized. And in this vein, we have developed an app that provides this kind of network visualization. It's called the Swag App. It was named by our youth. And its goal is to help youth activists think strategically about the social capital in their networks. Visualizations of network node characteristics help you think about the relative affordances of these nodes and who to engage in their social media posts. Part of our planned future work is to evaluate this app in the context of empowerment organizations to understand user experience and the impact on specifically individual and collective efficacy for engaging in activism. So to wrap up, today I've discussed how our group has used a variety of methods to identify how interactive computing techniques and platforms can directly address micro, mesosocial, and macrosocial determinants of health. And these case studies help illuminate design opportunities, findings, and open questions in the space of community wellness informatics. And I'll mention in conclusion a few directions for future work. So first, community wellness informatics is fundamentally about examining how technology can empower collectives to engage in, in various levels of change. A key direction for future work will be to systematically examine how to connect and empower neighborhood residents with shared group membership to engage in change. Designing tools that work in tandem with community organizations is important for building trust in these systems and providing social supports that can make them even more effective, as we saw in the case of the youth empowerment organization providing support that was instrumental in youth's ability to be resilient to negative pushback online. Furthermore, if there is a need for increased upstream research that is work examining how technology can actually operate at the mesosocial and macrosocial levels of change. And so what might this kind of socio-technical work look like? Well, for example, there's a need for more work examining how technology can help communities to challenge the status quo. And of course, we've seen how existing platforms like social networking tools can amplify social action and there's a need for more work that investigates how well these kinds of tools are supporting action amongst marginalized and underserved groups in particular, and how they can be designed to do so more effectively. And lastly, designing tools for and with marginalized and underserved groups is not enough. 
we need to be examining to what extent the systems we create are actually laying the groundwork for systemic long-term change. And this will require socio-technical solutions that aim to build up social, financial, human, and financial capital in populations that are marginalized and underserved. For example, tools that seek not only to nudge behaviors in the moment, but uh, also, that also provide experiences with the technology that build long-lasting skills, values, and environmental change. For example, the kinds of bonding, discovery, and educating moments that arose in the Story World project. So I'd like to conclude by thanking the students, collaborators, community partners, and funders that have made this work possible. I want to specifically thank um, Farnas, Herman, and Lily, the current and few former doctoral students who led the projects I described today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for this great talk. Uh, one of the things that we can't quite replicate is the big clap and applause at the end. <laughs> I think all of us would like to share. Thank you. So we are now open for questions um, and I want to encourage um, the audience, uh, feel free to raise your hand um, or um, uh, type up the question in the chat and I can help facilitate. And I encourage students in particular to ask questions. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Hi, this is C, and I'm currently a second year PhD student. And like, I really like, th first of all, thanks for giving this wonderful talk. And I really enjoy your research that aims to address problems in low SES communities. And I'm also interested in like leveraging personal informatics tool to help people like facilitate their health literacy. But like, it just made me wonder, like since we want to like leverage the technology to help um, like the low SES families, but what if what if people that they don't have access to technologies? Like, how do we address this problem? Like, yeah. So, do you have any like experience about this? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, this came up in a meeting earlier today. So, absolutely, access is like a fundamental um, uh, concern that we need to address and. Um, Tiffany Bino has like a great paper about intervention generated inequalities and how like right as we start to create these digital health innovations, one way in which you know th their very creation can exacerbate these health inequities is that they are made they're more more accessible to some populations than others. So it's a very important point. So I have a few thoughts on this. Um, one is that you know, if you'll notice, like most of my work has focused on mobile platforms and um, and and that is a platform that we see really so smartphones in particular see really growing in prevalence, um, even in low income groups, really high penetration in the United States, um, low income uh, populations. And as I was mentioning, you know, in fact, they're actually you know, relied upon more so for internet access than, than computers. So, um, so, so I think there's that. Um, I did talk about using wearable activity trackers, right? And so that's something that's not as prevalent. Um, and so our motivation for exploring um, the, you know, the potential of, of tools like that has been, uh, there have been a couple of reasons for that. One, um, because they do demonstrate so much promise and because so much of the work studying them has been done without attention paid to uh, groups, you know, specific groups that experience, you know, higher rates of health issues, um, there is a need to say, okay, you know, these things that we're creating, we're spending all of our time creating, are they actually going to be effective for all groups and how can we think about making them more effective for all groups so i think there's like an ethical imperative to, to do that um, also part of what we aim to do is to run studies that build up evidence that show that th these tools again not on their own but in collaboration with other um, social interventions 
can actually have positive impact in these communities so that that can actually impact policy um, and, and uh, affect change in terms of like reimbursement, you know, um, health insurance reimbursement or um, uh, uh, healthcare systems actually, you know, thinking about providing these to uh, these groups to, to, you know, address the access issues. So I think um, the building up the evidence is in, in convincing, you know, these different entities that the, these, it's actually worth the money to invest in them is, is a potential way to go. That's something that, um, we are doing some work um, with a health uh, a pharmaceutical company um, now that, that that's part of the large motivation there is like, okay, can we run this study and show that this tool is actually effective so that you know, they, we can actually convince these kinds of entities um, that it's, it's worth actually investing in, in these communities and making them more accessible. So yeah, I have other thoughts, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Andrea, we have a question in the chat from Emery. Hi, Andrea. This was a wonderful talk. I was wondering if in your work with low, lower SES communities, you'd seen anyone reacting or speaking to the tension between health measures like weight and societal stigma around obesity. This is similar to the stigma you talked about being related to sexual violence um, disclosures. Yeah, so do you mean, um, have I seen like individuals within the communities we're studying be um, pushed back on th this focus on weight because of the way that it is stigmatizing our society or can you say a little bit more? The confirmation. Yes, oh yes, okay, thank you. Um, that is interesting. Have we seen that? No, I have, we have not seen that in our studies, but, or not that I can recall, um, but I think it's an important issue. So, so certainly, you know, for example, as we do, a lot of the work that we do is um, social in nature. And so, you know, and, and connecting um, individuals together to collectively pursue their um, health and wellness journey together. Um, and so uh, when addressing, you know, weight-related issues, certainly we would want to try to mitigate against any, um, uh, yeah, sort of negative discourse that is, um, yeah, that is, that is stigmatizing individuals who are struggling with overweight and obesity. Um, so, but it's not something that we, that has come up um, in our work. There's actually, I had a similar question in a talk recently um, around um, sort of like, what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with the, um, the, the, the parallel um, discourses of on the one hand, you know, we need to, overweight and obesity is an epidemic, we need to address it, as well as the sort of um, empowerment of, you know, an acceptance of a variety of, of body images and like a pushback against, you know, the um, celebration of one type of body image and, and just trying to, to really question, uh, you know, what we as a society are saying is, is valued. Um, so I think, yes, these are, the right questions to be answered. It hasn't come up in our work, but a, another example of a societal level factor that would for sure um, be valuable to study even like some of the work we've been doing and studying um, social media movements. And, and there's a lot around, um, you know, addressing this obesity stigma. So that's, that's another interesting direction to explore. Um, so we are at the three o'clock mark, but if there are uh, more questions on Andrea, you're willing to um, to stay for a few more minutes, we, we probably can go a little bit longer.
So I have a question. I um, I, I really uh, have looked at the um, um, the map of uh, social determinants of health that you shared with us, and I keep going back to it once in a while. I really like that uh, that you actually put out that um, map as a contribution for our community to pay more attention to um, kind of the upstream levels at the meso and macro levels. And I was wondering if you have advice for like researchers, faculty and students in choosing research and how to choose research that my target macro or um, like these meso levels rather than an individual level um, and how to think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, part of it is, you know, uh, so much of the work that we do, for example, is, is community-based and working with community partners. And so what I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, increasingly do an even a better job of is really bringing in our community partners at the beginning to, to define the focus of our work. Like, you know, so, okay, we're, we're interested in, um, you know, maternal health. And, and so we have a project focused on that and, um, uh, and maternal health disparities in, in rural Black women in Georgia, that's a project. So we're bringing in, uh, we've created a community advisory board and it's made up of um, uh, women um, from rural Georgia who have recently delivered, as well as um, women's health, people from women's health advocacy groups and OBGYN and, and, and doulas and bringing them all together and saying like, okay, what, what should this work look like? And so I, I, I honestly think it's like so valuable to, to have, to prioritize their voices and say like, what do you see as the most pressing um, issue to address? Um, so I, I would start there because really like, you know, I, I in, in this talk, I was, you know, trying to advocate for more work on the upstream just to, to balance the scales a little bit in terms of the digital health work, because we've done so much work downstream, but of course, all of it's important. So like, even if, you know, ending up saying, you know, if, you know community stakeholders are like, actually, you know, we, we need specific support, you know, um, I don't know, with some, you know, uh, planning, meal planning, <laughs> you know, like meal planning for, for busy moms. And um, that's, that's what we need. Um, that's great. That's great. And it's not, you know, one is not more needed than the other. So, um, so I would start, I would start with the community and their priorities. Um, okay. Danielle, go ahead. Oh, um, actually, Joe asked a question. In yeah. The yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe, do you want to? I'll read it. Um, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks for your insightful talk. I'm curious about how you dealt with the safety issue in lower SES neighborhood that you mentioned. I've heard it could be unsafe to carry an expensive smartphone or a smartwatch in lower SES neighborhoods, which could make it difficult to deploy technology. Have you experienced this challenge? Yes, this is a good question. Um, we we have experienced challenges around um, definitely loss of of the trackers. I'm trying to remember. I believe we had participant at least one participant say that it was stolen. Um, I can't remember if that for sure. Um, but one of the things that we have done. So I, you know, I think thinking about like how to make. You know, even simple things like color choice for the activity brand, those brands and trying to make them like less less cons uh, conspicuous um and um yeah i think it's i think it's a good question so like the smartphones um you know we we participants have used their own smartphones and um so you know i think that's one way to address this sort of it's not like we're giving them expensive new flashy smartphones to use. Um, I think, you know, the, the flip side is that um, 
often uh, devices are also used as a status symbol. Um, and so, so often participants have, you know, really nice phones as, as well. Um, but the, the activity tracking, like the wristbands, that is a good point. Um, and, you know, I don't, we don't have, I don't have an answer for that, but thinking through, I think, how to make them um, as, you know, I guess it's a, I guess it's a balance, right? It's like, on the one hand, you might say, like, how do you make them so that they kind of blend in, that they're not super flashy, not standing out. But then at the same time, that might be something that um, the stakeholders from this these communities might desire and might want make them want to use it more. So, um, so yeah, it's a good question. It we haven't it hasn't been like a a major issue that's that's come up that's ha that's caused us to have to pause and say, um, okay, you know, for for the safety of these communities, we have to um, we have to think about a, another strategy. But it's a good question. Daniel, I think you had your hand up. Sure, I'll ask. I'll ask just a quick question. Um, so, like, I'm. I guess I'm thinking through when we want to design kind of higher level interventions. Um, should we be trying to kind of leverage some of the social technologies that people are already using, or should we tr be trying to take the individual technologies that people are using and try to figure out how to scale them up? And the answer might be like you know, I don't know, some combination of the two. Um, but that that's one of the things that I've been kind of grappling with in my work. And so I was curious if, if you had any thoughts on it. Interesting. So what would be an example of some of the individual? Oh, I, I, I just mean, should we be trying to like think through how to like change up or, or add on top of social networking things already, or when we think of something like a, 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 a fitness tracker, which was often designed for the individual and figure out how to, how to add uh, family or community level components on top of that? That is a good question. So definitely like when we um, did our systematic review, for example, one of the facilitators of you know adoption of the different health interventions and 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 use was definitely leveraging a platform that people already use so um it definitely seems like there's value in like where we can do that um to to take that as a first step versus trying to you know extend something that people aren't already using um that being said i mean you, you, I know, know very well, all, you know, the challenges of, um, you know, trying to co-op like a general purpose uh, social computing platform for health reasons. So, you know, now we're using it. Um, I mean, if, if, if we're talking about using, you know, uh, Facebook, for example, in, uh, you know, in a more private manner where it's like, you know, a Facebook group with just you and your family or something. Okay, that's one thing. But then when we're talking about, you know, using it more publicly, and then we have a context collapse and um, those kinds of challenges. So um, I don't think it's without uh, challenges, but it does seem like where we can um, build upon what people are already using that might facilitate uptake. I think this is uh, probably a good point to wrap up. I, yes, I see that from the <laughs> seminar coordinator. Uh, um, Andrea, thank you so much for um, uh, your amazing work that you presented today and for being able to join us. And I'm very thankful that we had the opportunity to hear you speak. Thank you so much. This is really fun. And thanks for all the great questions.